Hello there, Chapo Trapo Hauso. This is foreign movie correspondent Matt V. Brady just checking in with some thoughts on the film Patriot's Day. Um, the thing about Patriot's Day that really impressed me was how it really expands upon the Boston cinematic universe. Boston, of course, was a city, a fictional city created in the film Good Will Hunting and was uh, then used subsequently in The Departed and The Town, of course, but it's in Patriot's Day that it, I feel like it really almost comes alive. They have a fake police department, a fake marathon. They continue with that really silly, funny accent that they put on. It's really an incredible achievement. It rivals the uh, Marvel Universe and other similar creations, I think. And um, I think Marky Mark's going to probably win an Oscar for this one. Uh, the scene at the end of the film where he joins together with the New England Patriots to do, I believe, what they call a downyard rush to tackle the terrorist Jahar and tackle the bomb out of his hand. Uh, that was incredible. And, um, yeah, great film. start going hello everybody it's Chapo again we're back uh taking a break from uh our usually scheduled programming of news and current events and going back to our roots which is our love of the cinema of course there is a news hook for the film that we're going to talk about today and that of course is this past weekend's super bowl the big game that we all know and love where Boston and their New England Patriots managed to win again, uplift the nation's spirits, Ugh. and give me an ulcer without <laughs> even uh, intending to. Yeah, it was really something to watch because you could see people <clears throat> coalescing around the narrative of wouldn't it be nice if this white supremacist team full of Trump supporters got its ass kicked by a town from the blackest city in America, but uh-oh. It fell apart. Everyone was like, oh, I don't really believe in it. It's just, it would be fun. But then they kicked, started winning. The Falcons started winning, and everyone was like, oh, my God. Here's a little moment of catharsis I could have in my life. Here's a little thing, a little victory, a little psychic boost, a little bit of, you know, just a chant, just a little belief in my head that maybe the bad guys don't always win. And then, no, fuck you. They always win. The bad guys always fucking win. You live in Trump's America now. He'll be shitting in your ear for the rest of your life. Even your dreams are not safe. <laughs> in case you hadn't picked up on it already, we're talking about the film Patriot's Day, directed by Peter Berg, starring Mark Wahlberg. The, the film account of how the city of Boston came together, showed the rest of the world what it was made of, and how it runs on Duncan. <laughs> also, the real purpose of the film which is to give Boston their own 9-11 because they were jealous of New York. Something I've been saying for years. Yeah, we've been meaning to do this one for a while because we all saw it basically as soon as it came out with the intention of doing this very episode. But that was all the way back in 2016 when America was still a place of hope and love. When it was still a dumpster fire. <laughs> when the fire was still contained to a dumpster. Now, now the fire is everywhere. We didn't start it, folks, but we're living in it. So it's Patriots Day. It's the Patriots Day episode. It's the Marky Mark Boston Strong episode. We've got to decide right, who's right. running this, and we have to decide quickly. It's terrorism. We'll take it. And let's get an evidence for it started right over there. Clock is ticking. The world is watching. The suspect seen on the surveillance cameras. Two bombers. We gotta find these guys before they do this to someone else. We can't have our citizens on the streets with all these threats. Every inch of this city is getting searched. We're shutting it down. We're gonna go through this movie because it was quite extraordinary. It's now, it's the third movie in, I think now, a trilogy of films made starring Mark Wahlberg and directed by Peter Berg that sort of dramatize very, very recent disasters and atrocities in American history. Of course, the first one was Lone Survivor, about some Navy SEALs dying in Afghanistan. Uh, the second, of course, which came out also very recently, Deepwater Horizon, about um, 
oil spill in the Gulf. And now bringing it all back full circle to Mark Wahlberg's hometown of Boston and the Boston Marathon bombing. Now, it, it is really the perfect one because, I mean, they had Marky Mark playing like Texas shit kickers in those first two movies. Yeah. And that's just like, no, he, he has one location he has one he setting he's one of those he's one of those deep sea fish when you pull them up they explode you got to keep them <laughs> in the in the boston metro area so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna relive the the film experience and uh and, and the tragedy of the boston marathon bombing in general but um before we get in there i i always do when we see one of these movies uh i need to get i need to get a rundown of the of the theater experience as a whole uh, all, the, all the New York boys saw it together at Union Square. But first, I got to ask Matt, what was your theater experience with Patriots Day like? What was the crowd like? What were the trailers like? What was the atmosphere? I mean, there was really nobody in the theater. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was nothing. It was just, it's a typical bleak Midwestern time wasting experience. There was really no texture to it. Did you? Did That's you, what life is eat, like you, in the hinterlands. There's did, no did, texture to it. Did anything. you get any snacks? Yeah, I probably had. I think I had some popcorn. Okay, that's usually that's my go-to. Was uh, there security at the theater? There, no, it's not a place with like burly dudes with walkie-talkies or anything like that. This movie actually lost four billion dollars because Mark Wahlberg mandated that there be eight Bradley fighting vehicles stationed outside every theater to recreate <laughs> the experience in Boston at the time. Right, we saw this movie at I believe Regal Cinemas by Union Square, yep. and uh, there were. Uh, there were cops, there were security guards, and apparently just for this film, because we saw, I think it was a limited release, right? Maybe yeah, it was this, the first This week. wasn't the, the nationwide release. These folks, when you're a New York City elite, sometimes you get to see movies before the rest of the country, and we took full advantage of that by seeing basically the New York City premiere of Patriot's Day. We saw, we saw one trailer that stuck out of my head uh, for a film called The Shack. Mm -hmm. that, believe it or not, is not the story of a plucky uh, burger chain that has captured the nation's imagination. It is, uh, from, it's based on this like mega successful sort of popular fiction for a Christian audience about a guy whose uh, daughter is brutally murdered and then like questions why God exists and then meets her in the form of a sassy black lady. It's basically Mystic River for evangelical guys that wear prayer bracelets and relapse by going on a fellatio spree. They read this book to come back to the fold. Is that my daughter in there? Why, yes it is, sugar. Come on into the shack. <laughs> also, Toby Keith is in there. I think he did the oh, soundtrack. No, it's Sam Worthington and uh, I think Octavia Spencer. And it's like, but like he goes back to the shack like a year after his daughter's death, but then like goes into this world of magical realism and heaven, I suppose. I don't know. It looks uh, mind-bogglingly dumb, but uh, just filing that card for a future date for when uh, the show uh, well, comes we're, out. We're seeing it. We're, yeah, we're absolutely seeing it. it. So our theater experience was, you know, typical. Theater wasn't packed, but there was a fairly good crowd in there. Uh, we had good seats. We saw a lot of trailers. And then right after the trailers, the lights came up disconcertingly, and I was like, oh, no, it's happening all again. Party, man. Party, man. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it, it wasn't. It wasn't Party Man. It was Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon just came, comes in the theater, grabs a mic, and goes, "Hey, everybody! I'm Kevin Bacon. I just want to thank you all for coming out to this film. I'm really excited. I think it's a great one. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it." And um, now would be the good time to say, uh, for me personally, I had eaten an entire edible and was <laughs> trying as hard as possible not to just to maintain. With, with being one degree away from Kevin Bacon, but I was <laughs> fucking dying laughing. Uh, so Kevin Bacon addresses the audience in the movie theater and says, hey, everybody, you know, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, and New York's my town, and, you know, I remember seeing the, when the Boston Marathon bombing happened on TV, I remember thinking, oh, no, not again. <laughs> and, God uh, damn it, they are not comparable <laughs> events. <laughs> and, you know, this, here in New York after 9-11, uh, just to, I really remember the way the city came together, and uh, I think that's what uh, you know. Peter Berg and Mark Wahlberg, great actor, great director, very close to the city of Boston. I think that's what they portrayed in this movie. 
this feeling of Boston Strong and how the city came together. And I think it's a special. And I really thank you all for coming out to watch this movie. Do they not realize, do the Boston people not realize how much of a self own they're perpetrating by trying to make the Boston Marathon bombing their 9 11? Yeah. It's so fuck. I'm sorry. It's so rinky dink comparatively. <laughs> and that just exacerbates the difference between New York and Boston and makes them look like a provincial cow town. Well, without I mean, ex- more people die of fucking overdosing on remaindered uh, four loco in a weekend of Boston <laughs> than died of that fucking bombing without exaggerating literally a thousand times the amount of people died on yes. 9-11 <laughs> a, thousand, a times. thousand and i could see it kevin bacon when he comes in there and he grabs the mic there's how just like just how dejected he looked at the theater this limited release of what maybe they consider something of a prestige film was two-thirds yeah empty. no maybe i oversold how how full the, the theater was, was not full yeah. at all no no <laughs> but i guess this was some way to like juice word of mouth of this movie among influencers like us but had they known that like you know four, every, five ironic shitheads are in the theater <laughs> just specifically to half make the fun people of this were movie. in that theater uh so they could talk about it on their podcast yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, uh loper loper and randy were there <laughs> <laughs> hey everybody i'm here to see this boston who, who are your guys boston <laughs> uh obama was there with Marin. <laughs> <laughs> he was like mark i remember it like it's yesterday i said uh i don't care what happens i'm going to ignore this it doesn't matter i'm just glad there's nothing in this movie about the weird legs <laughs> <laughs> because it was a false flag perpetrated would, by me i would just like to uh address all the people who participated in the marathon today, I would just like to say, you didn't finish that. <laughs> um, I did do Sandy Hook. I did do Boston. <laughs> so yeah, that was our, I, I think, rather unique uh, movie theater experience for this, where we actually got to be addressed by one of the stars of the film himself to come out and you know big it up uh, to, like I said, five ironic shitheads, one of which who was just basically fucking completely spun on an edible. <laughs> <laughs> Will had a stevia edible. <laughs> no, I had a scarf that I was like, I was literally like stuffing it in my mouth to stop from like just guffawing out loud. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Bacon. I, I like, I, I respect your work. I'm really sorry. It's the drugs. I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah. You so- wanted to be like, people got to know. People got to know why he was killed. <laughs> oh, bring all those motherfuckers on, man. Bring their college degrees in here. I got nothing to hide. You can't buy me. They laugh at the movie because they were communists. <laughs> They were communists. <laughs> also, that's You've not... never been fucked in the ass, Mr. Christman. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were liberal. You were liberal, Mr. Chapo. That's why you're laughing at this. Oh, I, I, I like Kevin Bacon. We, we, I think he saw it. He saw it. He saw it. He saw it. And, and he did not, like he did in Mystic River, he didn't try to half ass a Boston accent. The, the only person in this fucking movie who didn't try to half ass a Boston To be Boston fair, he accent. wasn't playing a guy from Boston. Right, but right. like everyone else didn't care. They yeah, didn't yeah. do it. Well, okay. you know, what I like about Kevin Bacon is that uh, he's not told by the studio that does this. He just walks around town, and when he sees a movie theater <laughs> playing a movie <laughs> yeah. he's in, he's like, I should say a few words. And he actually he didn't... He does that thing about Boston and New York in every movie. Like, he went into Up, and he was like, look, when Joe Carr, you know, threw that pressure cooker. <laughs> and they're like, our, our kids are here. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> So that's the, that's the the preamble to our, our 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 wonderful movie theater experience. Lo, these many months ago, but okay, the film the film starts. And well, I th- the the I think what's really poignant and interesting is that the first image we see is an epigram on the screen. It says, "Marathon clock looked like it was at four oh nine when the first explosion happened. Elites long gone. Triers then. <laughs> Big hearts then." <laughs> <laughs> the, movie, the movie actually follows Chris Jones on his journey through a bottle full of bourbon and a page full of words and a heart full of spite, but just enough goddamn energy to make it through the day and tell the fucking truth. If Writing was a woman fam- and I was going to fuck her. <laughs> For anyone not familiar, uh, uh, Esquire writer and uh, bourbon bastard extraordinaire Chris Jones had an amazing tweet about the marathon bombing that... I just did. That's not actually in the movie. It was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Where the movie actually does open up, it opens up on Mark Wahlberg playing a Boston uh, police detective. Tommy or racism? Uh, yeah. He, Mark Wahlberg plays a Boston police uh, detective. The film opens the, the night before the marathon. He's rousting a lovable 
enjoyable, typical Boston figure, which is a um, sub-mental white person (laughs) 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 who's intoxicated, um, a piece of shit, and uh, literally doesn't know the word for a clothes iron, so he calls it a smoothie. And he keeps talking about it. He's like, yo, he's like, this freaking this freaking girl hit me in the head with a smoothie. And then Mark Wahlberg's character is like, a smoothie? What are you talking about? She's she drinking she, she, she's using juice at you? And he's like, no, you know, a smoothie. You know, the thing you use to make clothes smooth. And he's like, I can't deal with this shit anymore. I'm too old. Man. That, that guy, that actually was the mayor of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, it's an interesting way to open because after that scene, you're really not. You're not dreading bad things happening no. to the city of Boston. <laughs> this is a completely like throwaway scene just to give you some of that, that local flavor of, that we all know and love about Boston. But I think it was done very strategically because throughout the rest of the movie, it introduces you to Mark Wahlberg's character, who is the only character in the movie who is completely fictional. He's a composite character that's like the audience's stand-in for like the... the everything well, that's also, good, good oh, about yeah, Boston. He's the embodiment of the city of Boston, yeah, which and, is, of and, course, why... To- fucking Marky Mark made this movie. He talks all these bullshit interviews about how I wanted to talk about the heroes. We wanted to talk about, we wanted to say about the sacrifice and how we came together. No, it's this fucking asshole taking another chance to remind everybody that he's Joe Boston. Fuck that Affleck. Fuck Matt Damon. I'm Joe Boston. Fuck all of you. That's why this movie exists. We learn that Marky Mark's character is an alcoholic detective who has been disgraced in some way. It's not explained how. I think he was disgraced by not being enough of an alcoholic he did not have the bal that you required his to put commanding on the officer tried to like make him keep taking shots to jameson and he was like no i gotta go home to my wife and kids and they were like give me that badge <laughs> how this, dare you and how dare you sir the, uh, <laughs> officer o'flanagan malley uh court county <laughs> you not fulfilled your n-word quota <laughs> Uh, th- and that uh, the chief of police, right, is uh, John played by Goodman. John Goodman, who is a real character. That, that is a real person. John Goodman shows up randomly as uh, on the, the scene of a yeah. minor domestic yeah. dispute. It's really just, weird. Just to like give it's, shit to Mark Wahlberg's just, character. It's it's a, it's stealth exposition about the relationship yeah. between the two and all that stuff. Now, my theory about this this sort of throwaway opening scene that just gives you a, a, a like I said a little flavor of the people and character of Boston is to just show you a little bit of the, the classic Boston shithead because the movie is constrained by real events. Much of the rest of the movie will be spending time with incredibly affluent and educated white people who are nothing like this asshole. Yeah, so no, it's creating a little people. working class sympathy as contrasted to, let's be honest, the yuppies who suffered yeah, <laughs> by the marathon yeah. bombing. None of, the, none, of the, none of those Southie guys who are the avatars of Boston were up when that fucking when, that, when, the, when the when the when the marathon started, or even when the bomb went off, the, yeah. the, the marathon is the big sporting event for the yuppies, but. The sporting event for Southie the day before the slur tournament. <laughs> it's like the wing ball yeah. in Philly. Yeah, they're like, who could say the most slurs with a mouthful of Jameson? <laughs> yeah, no, the day that they guys that those guys actually get up before noon to commemorate something is the anniversary of the day that they burned Judge Garrity's house down in 1975 <laughs> because of buzzing. Flagpole day. Yeah, flagpole day. <laughs> We're introduced to the city of Boston. And then, like, then it's morning. It's the day. It's Patriots Day, which is a real holiday only in Boston. Of course. Oh my God. We're like, where they always they run the Boston Marathon on Patriots Day in Boston every year, and there's always a sax sax game to go along with it. But uh, so, so the day begins, and we we sort of like see these vignettes of of characters that are all going to sort of coalesce around you know around this moment that we all know it's coming. And I want to talk first about the, uh, like I said, in contrast to the shithead who didn't know what a fucking iron was. <laughs> I want to talk about like the, we, we meet an incredibly attractive, wealthy, and nice young couple who are starting their day. They're like med students. They're, you know, good people. Uh, they wake up, they have breakfast, they're starting to plan their day. They make love. Here is where Peter Berg really earns his money <laughs> as a director of sort of like subtlety and grace. Is he uses a little something called dramatic foreshadowing by taking a several incredibly gratuitous and lingering shots of this nice young couple's legs and feet <laughs> while they're in the bed. Yeah, yeah. While they're while they're like you know in a postcoital embrace, he just the camera just slowly pans down to their beautiful intertwined legs and feet intact. Non blown off, and, <laughs> and as Matt said, 
only Quentin Tarantino has put more legs and feet <laughs> in a motion picture than yep. Peter Berg does in the first half an hour of this yep. movie. But it's not sexual. It's just, hey, you ever notice how much you love your feet? <laughs> you, 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 you ever you notice how useful the, these things yeah, are? You, re, you rely on them every day and you take them for granted. Maybe like, you shouldn't. That, that's one avenue. Then we have, uh, we meet a few other characters, including um, a, uh, like a, a Chinese immigrant who will also come into play later. Um, we meet other members of the Boston Police Department. We meet uh, Mark Wahlberg's family. Uh, his wife is played by Michelle Monaghan, who I think as we were preparing for this, I had the thought, imagine having her career now. I mean, no knock on her, but she plays some asshole's wife in literally every movie and thing that she's in now. So I mean, that's the fate of a lot of actresses, sadly. It's a, it's but a shame. She's yeah. like one of the top asshole's wife yeah. actresses going. And she's like, honey, don't don't forget to take a shot of Jameson before yeah, you yeah. leave today. <laughs> and he's like, honey, I know. My leg hurts. I have to drink. Don't forget uh, your bag of weed to drop on the guys in Roxbury. <laughs> <laughs> you have emotions to suppress about your abusive father today. <laughs> <laughs> so like, the plot is, like as we alluded to, uh, Mark Wahlberg has been sort of knocked back. He has to do some bullshit detail, which includes like just putting on a regular cop's uniform like an asshole with like the reflection vest and like doing security at the finish line of the marathon with all the VIPs where everyone every politician is going to make fun of him and be like N- nice vest you look like you look you look gay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like come on I, it's, it's one last thing I gotta do is look gay for the mayor yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys are enjoying my Boston accent by yeah, the way I'm, really I'm gonna good. be doing it a lot yeah. throughout well, the, that, this that episode was, that I mean, you were doing the New York guy, right? Yeah, that's we, what yeah. sounded like. Yeah, yeah. I, I Every mean, East Coast shit basically <laughs> sounds the same. Um, so then we also meet, you know, the heroes of the movie. <laughs> um, couple of plucky cu- young couple brothers of pr- from the caucuses. Plucky young brothers. Another, another thread I'd like to, th- to bring in here now about our movie theater experience in general Okay, the guys that got to play the Sarnayevs in this movie, I thought were actually really good. Oh, yeah. I think they, they did a really good job, I think they did a good yeah, job yeah. of portraying them and like the dynamic between the genuinely psychopathic older brother and the sort of like idiot stoner who just sort of goes along to right. get along because he's enthralled yeah. to a more powerful will. Right. That's the Klebold Harris dynamic, yeah. kind of, yeah. Um, that being said, the two actors that they got to play them, if you put them both into the Brendel Fly teleporter, Felix would walk out. <laughs> <laughs> like, they, like uh, uh. Felix looked exactly like the third Sarnaya brother, and I was so afraid. Like, I think I went up and got to go to the bathroom at one point, and I started to get worried you had been like detained outside. That moment when you see a movie and you look like the villain in the movie. Uh-huh. Well, I, I do. Th- I, it is amazing that. The guy they the guy who played Jokar, he's he's very good. He does that like affectless shithead millennial very well. But uh he's like way less attractive than the actual Jokar. Yeah, the real Jokar is really high. It's like you look at him and you're like, that's the best looking guy they could get to play him. No wonder there's a million tweens who want him out of jail. That guy's a fucking he's gorgeous. I mean There was one really good line actually in that early that first scene with them where like uh um Tamerlane said something like are you ready? You ready to do this? Like, it's like strike a blow against the fornicators or whatever. And he was just like, I don't know, man. I'm a fornicator. Yeah. And he was like, shut up. It's not funny. Uh, <laughs> you joke, are we have to pray? Uh, I need a safe space. <laughs> well, I, mean, he had- I, I actually, I, not just in looks am I a combination of the two brothers, but in attitude. Well, I'm I mean, mostly a, a millennial shithead who sleeps till one. But, you but also, also are, I have. You also obsessively work out. Yeah, exactly. So, I'm like both of them. Yeah, you, yeah, are, you are no, both of them. It's like the third brother. It's cut to where, where is Filev. Uh, no, no, he, he is, he is the synthesis. He's playing Metal Gear he's, Solid. He's the fornicator, the self fornicator. No, this is blowing my mind. Felix is the synthesis of the Sarnayev <laughs> brothers because one of them was a, was a jock and the other one was a poster. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. they come together to form the synthesis. That's probably I mean, a lazy shithead, except for like one thing. That's yeah. me, baby. It's like because Johar was on Twitter. Like he had, a yeah, he was. He loved posting, and he like he like he like Game of Thrones and weed. I mean, he could have been an irony dude the if way, he hadn't had that asshole older I'm, brother. I'm jumping ahead now in, in the narrative, but I want to bring up. There's a great scene that again is 100 percent true. Where like after the bombing has happened and they're back at the house just watching it on TV, being like, 
dude, I wish we'd killed more people. This kind of <laughs> sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but he, but uh, Johar is getting texts from his other shithead gamer friends. Yeah, they're, yeah, like, yeah. they're like, dude, I think I saw you on the TV. What's up, LOL? And then he's just like, dude, better not text me, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude, when you kill five people in real life, do you really get a drone strike? <laughs> no, nah, dude, I didn't even kill five. <laughs> <laughs> These are all totally real text messages, which again is terrifying. It's, it shows them to be exactly how stupid that they were, and they were two incredibly stupid men. But I mean, doesn't that also make Boston look bad that these two total dopes vex their entire Boston yeah, yeah, it's for like a the, week? It's like the Three Stooges made you go into martial law. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need a fucking lockdown right now. They have dropped a piano on the professor's head, and they have uh, put a candle in the dowager's cleavage. <laughs> Several people's eyes have been gouged. <laughs> yeah. We have we have p- pies flying everywhere. The mayor has been hit by a crust. pie. And seltzer, we repeat. So Peter Berg, he puts all these chess pieces on the board, right? And is like ticking down the days. Uh, we also meet J.K. Simmons, who plays a... Uh, I always fuck this up. Watertown. Watertown. Water water it's the water... Wa- water... <laughs> That is what the cops were. <laughs> He's the waterhead chief of police, and like he wakes up and goes straight to Dunkin' Donuts. Straight and there is Dunkin'. so much Dunkin' Donuts shit in this movie. Yeah, it's is. incredible. Like he goes in there, and they're like, the you know, like the nice lady behind the counter is just like knows him by name, and he's like, I'll just have the regular, like I always do. <laughs> yeah, he gets like a culotta, right? He gets yeah. a culotta. And it's like, doesn't he sip it and go like, mm, that's good culotta? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Another, yeah. another. There literally is a scene where someone name checks a culotta yeah. and says it's good stuff. Here's how dumb this is. That wasn't product placement. They were too stupid to get paid for all <laughs> yeah. that shit. Well, but no, you know what? That's it's... good directing because that is actually what Boston is like. Yeah. They fucking love Dunkin' Donuts. And do. once again, part of the just parade of self owns of this movie because Dunkin' Donuts is shit. No, it is awful. Fuck you, dude. Yeah, it's it's Dunkin' Donuts terrible. is shit, dude. Fuck it's awful. Off. It's dude, so it's bad. Great. It's so shit. It's this great. is why he, this donuts. is why Felix was never radicalized <laughs> like his son is. Those donuts he are loves like fucking it. sawdust. They're shit. garbage. They're garbage. It's oh like my god, dude. A yoga mat, dude. You know what's great is you get the old fashioned glaze gun. You throw that bitch in the refrigerator. You got your uh, thirty two ounces of coffee that only costs two seventy nine. <laughs> And uh, you enjoy that. You go to the gym. You get diarrhea. And then you game, <laughs> you game for 13 hours. You wake up at 1. Everyone yells at you because you slept through an important business meeting, <laughs> even though you are a 25% owner of the company. Uh, yeah. So why don't you try walking a mile in my shoes? <laughs> you talking shit on the dunk? <laughs> uh <laughs> So, so anyway, eventually Jokar and Tamerlane uh, drop off their backpacks at the at finish line. They go off. We all know what happens at the finish line. And then it's just like everything's like terrorism here in America on the street. People are screaming. They're like, they don't know what's going on, but they know that it's happened again. It's happened again, and Mark Wahlberg will be there at every step of the investigation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he is the only man in Boston who knows anything about the city. Yeah, of that was that okay, was the best now, part. We need to get okay. We need to get to what I think is, I think the crowning achievement of this movie, the best scene in the movie. Okay, the bombings happened. Okay, the FBI has been taken over the investigation, headed by Kevin Bacon. The city of Boston, they're like, we're rolling out everything. Like, it's all hands on deck. They have this huge, like, airplane hangar or warehouse that they create, like, the FBI command center in. They set up all the fucking computers. They have a whole staff to, like, break down all the images and security camera footage of, like, from every angle of the Boston Marathon to see, to find these perpetrators who are still at large, apparently. They hit a, they hit a brick wall. They hit a dead end. What do they do? They invite in Mark Wahlberg's completely fictional character to help them recreate the scene of the crime. What happened was they took all the evidence from the scene, marked in bags, and then they drew a grid that's supposed to represent the finish line of the bombing. And they strew they strew all that shit out there. And then Which they, I'm sure they, is real FBI procedure. I mean yeah, that's realistic. Yeah. Uh, and then they're like scratching their heads going, what, what's in what's in this square? What is that? Yeah. What could be on this street in downtown Boston? That, they we need a real local. They we call they call knows. Mark Wahlberg's character in the middle of the night and they're like, we need you to come in. And he's like anything for the city of Boston. (laughs) And he comes in and they're like, you were on the scene. You know Boston. We need your help. And he literally goes into like, he's like walking through the recreated crime scene and then literally goes into like Boston shithead bullet time. (laughs) (laughs) To just sort of like... (laughs) 
he sees the ones and zeros and using his knowledge of just being a Boston shithead he like he knows where all the security cameras are he's like Oh yeah, Joey's cousin tried to to steal some uh, remainder uh, whiskey bottles outside the back and stole a bike. They put a camera there now, and then like they bring it up, and some guys like we have white hat on camera one, <laughs> the, camera two, white hat is on camera two, and he like he walks through the scene and like recreates in his head, and he's like, uh, check the crate and barrel across the street, and they're like. Couldn't anyone else have done this? I, think, yeah, I mean, anyone real... else in the city would know that there's a crate and barrel on yeah. fucking Boylston Street. Or Google Maps would have known. Yeah. But Google like, Maps real, would have done the it. Real, to make it realistic, it should have been Wahlberg, and he's like, I assaulted the Vietnamese fuck who owns that one. <laughs> I assaulted the Cambodian asshole that runs the fucking crate and barrel. I assaulted the KFC manager here. <laughs> yeah, but, but before that, he, in his first, like... Uh, contribution at the very beginning when they're still figuring out what the procedure oh, this is. Oh, so good. Uh, he just pipes up in this bun- in this big throng it's like of screwing, high the, level brass. The, gover- the governor agents. is there. Yeah, the yeah. governor's there, and he goes, "We should talk to the victims. <laughs> we got to find out what they saw." And they're just like, "You're right, sir. You're you're right, our sergeant or whatever. We got to get to the hospitals." It's like, "Holy shit!" The governor's like. Who's this belligerent asshole? <laughs> He's making a lot of sense. Yeah. And so, oh, this introduces the uh, uh, a new like central tension of the film, which is between the feds and uh, Boston right. Strong. Yeah, because Kevin, because Kevin, Kevin Bacon, Bacon is like, basically a cuck as the head FBI guy. Because he gets there and he's like, I don't want to call it terrorism. There'll be anti-Muslim backlash. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, listen, you fucking queer. We got to know this is terrorism so that the people of Boston will come together to stop it. Well, that's what when Mark Wahlberg's character says. He's like, we're not using our best asset. It's the city. city. Yeah. The city of Boston is on our side. Those are not our guys. Meanwhile, you guys aren't any closer to identifying the two we're really looking for. We need to release those pictures. If we release the photos now, we have zero control. If we overplay our hand, we may force these guys to react. Gentlemen, if I may, right now, Boston's working against us. Yeah, that's normal. You got to murder, no one rats. We don't got that problem. Because in this city, when it comes to terrorism, everybody wants to talk. Look, you got a lot of people talking, but they're talking about the wrong people. You release the photos of our guys, sit back and listen, trust me. You got to stop letting Boston work for us, I'm telling you. I understand. Boston, but I can't just snap my fingers. This decision goes all the way up to the attorney general. They give me his number. I'll call him right now. This is my city, Rick. He like they're like this isn't just like a rape or assault. We don't stand for terrorism here. <laughs> <laughs> he says like terrorism. Boston's not going to stand for that. Like. Every other city, they'll be like, "No, I want to aid and abet the terrorists." And but in Boston, we want to stop terrorism, and that, in, is, unless it's the IRA, I, of course. I mean, yes, yeah. <laughs> that's not terrorism. Well, that's the thesis of the film: is that uh, no, this this crime wasn't solved by anti-terrorism experts. No, it was solved by Boston fucking grit and pride. Yeah, uh, and like Kevin Bacon has to play this impossible role where he's just like screaming and getting so fucking mad at the Boston locals, going, "No, Boston is not strong." Boston has no pride whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, you will yeah. never solve this crime. The Red Sox will never win a World Series. What's that they already did? I take it back. Boston does not have a burgeoning cocktail scene. <laughs> Actually, let's let, back to the Super Bowl. Can we talk for a second about what the real Boston's police department did on game yeah, day? Yeah, oh, it was fucking incredible. Again, this is these are the people being valorized by this movie, but the Boston Police Department's official Twitter account tweeted after the game on Sunday, Commissioner Goodell, when you come at, you know, TB12, Tom Brady 12, like you're insulting a whole region of the country. Oh, jeez. I mean, yeah. A whole region of the country. I, as a Boston police officer, I hate, I hate it when people are falsely accused of something with little to no evidence. <laughs> It's my least favorite thing. The Boston Police Department's still angry about Deflategate. Roger Goodell, worse than the Sarnayevs, in my opinion. Actually, the number of people he's probably killed through negligence, I, th- oh, yeah, I think he's more. probably killed way more than oh, the Sarnayevs, actually. Shit, absolutely yeah. higher death count right there. Um, okay, so like the investigation is in full swing. And I thought, like, actually, I'm not saying this to be ironic, but I thought the parts of the movie with the Sarnayevs were the most compelling because like they had like an there was like a there was an energy there like it was sort of like they're on the run there's things happening it's sort of like the entire world is closing in on these two morons and I thought like I said the way they portrayed their characters was pretty accurate yeah oh yeah, yeah. like and like just how fucking like just unprepared how dumb they are and like this kind of fantasy they have of like 
living out in real life a Grand Theft Audio auto scenario yeah. where you just go on a rampage, basically, because like that's what they tried to do. Pretty and it much. was fundamentally a, a a strong depiction of what is an abusive relationship between these two siblings. But like you know, Jahar was also an asshole. Yeah, Jahar was an asshole too. But it did speak to an important central point about terrorists that they're mostly fucking shitheads. They're mostly oafs. Like, I mean, uh, Muhammad Atta was like one of the only competent terrorists in the last thirty years. Well. Okay, there's the scenes where they, they show Jahar's college friends who are idiot stoner gamers, and they're like, dude, are you see this shit on the news? It, it, doesn't that look a lot like our friend? And then they like go into his dorm room, and they're like, hey, why is there a backpack full of empty firecrackers? Should we tell anyone about that? No, probably not. <laughs> and then one of the friends comes in and guys points to the TV and goes, guys, that and this. And then, humana, humana, humana. And, you th- and you think, like, oh, here's the voice of reason. They're probably going to go to the police. And then the next time you see them, it's like the next act, and they're just stoned again and playing fucking video games. Yeah. Like nothing happened. There. I'd like to say that that was made up, but again, yeah, that, that was 100% happened. real. Happened. And that's like the real life version of those. Uh, Bush era anti drug commercials where like the guys at the the drive through run over a little girl because they're stoned. <laughs> yeah, those These are so guys good. are the real life version of those like anti weed commercials. <laughs> yeah, the, from like circa two thousand four. This movie does not offer a very positive depiction of marijuana use among the young or gaming or gaming. Well, yeah. alcohol, I mean, marijuana use hurts the alcohol industry, which obviously the people of Boston would be opposed <laughs> to. Uh, and and well, you know, going on Felix's point, I mean. The, uh, picture this already it's like these are homegrown terrorists essentially even though they came to this country when they were much younger and I, I believe uh, the older one Tamerlane had some training and he Chechnya, returned to Dagestan like and, and Chechnya for a period and of time and he took you know his, his wife is uh, his wife is Caucasian right his wife is an, uh, like a actually well, he was born, Caucasian born in too, literally yeah, you know what I mean uh and Do better. So they got all right. So they got radicalized, and you see them in this movie. Like they're making breakfast. Like Tamara has a, has a young daughter, and they're just watching like uh, fucking uh, ISIS videos or, or maybe Al Qaeda videos of uh, people making pressure cooker bomb. Anyway, uh, it's obvious that for someone like Jokar growing up here, who's like clearly just obsessed with uh, getting high girls and playing games, like he doesn't give a shit about any of this. None of this would have happened if he didn't have that abusive uh, brother who convinced him, who, you know, radicalized him. I think he may not basically. have given a shit about, like, the the broader, like, jihad or whatever, but I think he, like, it's very easy for someone like that to, even if they don't really believe in it, as we know now about many of the people who join ISIS, attach it to because it creates a kind of ethnic, nationalist, spiritual purpose and, and glory and identity yeah. for them I'm, in a way that's very seductive for but the, young violent shit I, I don't think it's just that though I mean like what you know if you were a shithead like Joe Carr what would you do you know fucking 300 years ago if you were born in Belgium you go to the Congo to kill a guy and that was part of growing up I mean yeah you can attach like fucking Salafism or whatever to it but that's just like a trapping around this like you know weird urge to kill a lot of young people. Well, I want to echo something that I feel I think Felix you said this after we saw the film and walked out the theater that how much of a shithead do you have to be to have that lifestyle that this kid had going to a university and just doing college kid shit but then watching these fucking videos of guys in caves going, "Oh yeah, I want to be that. That looks fucking great." I mean, yeah, that's pretty incredible. Joker's not a guy who like understood Islamic theology or anything like that. I mean, the whole movie, he's just a dope like, oh yeah, we'll get paradise, right? I know this is hard to understand. Fucking of mice and men. I know this is hard to understand, Virgil, but for some young men, the gaming lifestyle is insufficient. (laughs) I reject that. I reject that. Anyway, my ultimate point with that, and this is something I thought like heavily about from that depiction, which I thought was, you know, a a good depiction of those two, uh, for, you know, for for what I know, to the extent of my knowledge, that, I mean, isn't the challenge in a pluralistic free society in stopping terrorism and people like that is to prevent our dumbest citizens from being radicalized by just asinine, idiotic ideologies, whether it's that or uh, whether it's uh, Pizzagate, which is like our Wahhabism. Yeah, no, I mean... It's actually, it's interesting, like, they sort of, con- this goes out the main thread a little bit, but it's interesting the confluence between, like, being an alt-right shithead and being a Salafist. Like, now guys on Twitter who synthesize the JAN or ISIS, like, hashtag Sunni genocide, which dominant group experienced uh, demographic doom. Where have you seen that before? 
And they did like it's the same thing. Like you see Mike Sternovich on a video, or you see like fucking Khalid Sheikh Mohammed on a video. <laughs> why would either? Why would you look at either of those guys and go, "That's cool. I want to be that." Well, unless you're well, totally I, I, fucked actually, up. Actually, the best scene in the movie is after they've kidnapped this young Chinese immigrant named Dun Meng. He's a real person. Again, this all like the, the most realistic parts of the movie. Like they have good material to go off of. They don't have to exaggerate. They carjack this guy like as they're on the run that night, and like the whole fucking like there's a nationwide manhunt for them, and they carjack this poor dude. And there's a scene where like they're talking to him in the car, and they're they're listening to news reports, and like the news is just like in what's being called like the worst domestic terrorist attack since nine eleven, and then fucking Tamerlane is like can you believe this shit to his hostage is like, can you believe this shit, man? The way they lie to you, the fucking government did nine 11. And he was just like, you, you don't, you know that. Right. And he was like, yes, yeah, I, I do. And they're like, are you saying that because you just don't want to die? And he was like, and the, I think the best line in the movie, he goes, no, I, I'm sorry. I just, I, I don't know who did nine 11. <laughs> and then from the back, Jahar just goes, that's what's so fucked up about this country, man. Educate yourself, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the Zarnames, that's what I learned. The Zarnames are info wars, guys. Yeah, 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 what that's the true. fuck? Yeah. Although I believe in my heart that that scene is in the movie as a slight way to delegitimize 9-11 for New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Say, Not a real terrorist attack, okay? You are, oh, yeah, 9-11, that was a government inside job that does not count as terrorism. Boston bombing terrorism, number one terrorism. But like, so like, Timberland, and again, this is actually true. He said to them, the government did 9-11 to make people attack Muslims or think real Muslims do that. So in his mind, literally after blowing up a bunch of people at like a crowded public event, is just like, here's what I'm going to do in response to that, yeah. is actually as a Muslim, <laughs> is just kill a bunch of innocent that people. Holy shit, dude. This reminds me exactly of my friend growing up. He was... <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. It does. Of it course does. it does. It of does. course it does, Felix. Yes, it does. Because, okay, so my friend, he, he was the 27-year-old who, who hung out with 16-year-olds. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he gave me his friend's ID to go to bars when I was 16, and the friend was in prison for a sex offense. So this is just, like, great, oh my God, great, feel... ta great time in all our lives. But uh, anyway, so... One time we like went to his house and he just started crushing up Xanax. So we started doing Xanax and he's like, I hate my fucking neighbors. And we were like, why? And he goes, because they think I stole their grill just because I'm a criminal. <laughs> and, and so his response to this was to get us like more fucked up to start drinking Mickey's hand grenades with him and run around his neighborhood stealing his neighbor's mail and potted plants <laughs> for suspecting him of being a thief. <laughs> So yeah, no. Well, there I mean, you he, go, prejudice. Yeah, he, you know, he, it's he, a vicious cycle. I was Tamerlane, and he was. Uh, <laughs> or I, I was Joe Carr, and he was Tamerlane. And now you're both of them. <laughs> yeah, now I'm both of them. Idiots! How did we stop our local oafs from <laughs> using the internet? I mean, I aided and abetted a local <laughs> oaf. So. Oh, well, you were young. You Felix, didn't know any better. I would probably do that. Felix, now. thanks for uh, using the podcast to want to get once again confess to minor felonies. <laughs> I, that was like ten years ago. Oh, okay, probably, I was a yeah, minor. Statue of limitations. Statue of limitations. Worry, you know, you were a minor. You were a minor. I think yeah. we need diversionary programs to slot them into you know wholesome pursuits like gaming. No, what they need to do is ban the internet. <laughs> <laughs> probably it's that the would, fucking that would internet. Do you really I mean. We're it's the the internet is killing us all. We I would have gone down that. a path yeah. of crime just out of convenience with my twenty seven year old friends <laughs> if it wasn't for <laughs> the internet. This is like what I do now is the best outcome for a shithead like me. It yeah, prevented but it's, it's me. It's a pretty from rare uh, outcome, I would argue. Yeah, there's, there's a rare there's not a lot group. of. If it yeah. weren't for the internet, we're, we're blazing the trail. To yeah. be honest, not nah, dude. You just need mentorship. Younger shitheads need to be mentored by older posters, as I was. <laughs> I we should start, actually, this should be the Chapo Charity Program. Yeah. Like de-radicalizing youth. Urban Chapo Urban Achievers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we need to reach out. But, uh, so anyway, I, actually, I want to I go back to the scene with, with them and, and Dun, Dun Mang in, in, in the car, which I thought was genuinely actually a very well done scene in the movie. Yeah, Because the scene there... It's, it was well it, acted. This, this is well acted, and it was like a funny, scary conversation that really happened between these two guys. And then they, they park at a gas station, right? And 
Johar gets sent in like the little bitch he is to get like fucking beef jerky for the road trip to New York. I mean, that was their plan was to go to New York. By the way, if they had completed that plan, Boston would have gotten sunned again. It's it was, true. They would be called the Times Square bombers. Yeah. Oh. Like, no. <laughs> yep. But anyway, it would be like the Pentagon. Like, the, yeah, that happened, yeah. but nobody really. Remembers I mean, re- it. really, if the guys went to New York, they wouldn't have done anything because they would have gotten stomped out by two guys in NBA jeans. <laughs> 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 they would have just gone to the M&M store and yeah. been like. Actually, America's pretty good. Caleb would have stopped that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, so, so the uh, Meng is their hostage, right? And he's just like he has his seatbelt on, and you're and you know you're sitting there and you're thinking like, if I stay with these guys, I'm going to die a hundred percent. Like they've I've got me in the car already. That's bad enough. I need to do something now. And there's like a scene of high tension where he actually gets the seatbelt undone and just makes a break for it, and just like bolts across like a two-lane highway to another gas station and like runs in there and is like call the cops call the cops call the cops That's- Zokar and Tamerlane give up they're like fuck it we just gotta peel out they take off he gets away can I just say that's that's really that was very tense scene that was really scary and I don't know what I would do in that situation because I have a hard enough time opening taxi cab doors under no duress. <laughs> <laughs> I would have like just given up like five seconds well, and like just shoot I thought me. it was a good scene because it wasn't exaggerated at all but it really it was like a stake so like that was an actual act of courage that I think anyone could imagine yeah. being in that moment thinking like holy shit I just need to make a break for it and he did it and he got away so good for him and he, he goes and he goes to that convenience store so he goes store. to a convenience store and he says call the police call the police it's the bombers or whatever who do they send out of the entire city of Boston but officer Mark Wahlberg which sets up actually my favorite scene in the movie <laughs> which is this amazing meta moment of Mark Wahlberg debriefing a um, Asian man in a Boston convenience store. And he's like, you're talking about the bombers? And then he's just like, you're real brave, buddy, for getting away. Like, thanks, man. And then like he runs out and then Deng says, go get those motherfuckers. <laughs> this, was but, this is this point in the, the, this is the point in the movie where, like I said, it's this meta scene of Mark Wahlberg uh, sort of hassling an Asian man in a Boston convenience store and Felix just turns to me and goes, he's going to take that guy's eye, too. And again, I fucking lost this, Well, it. You, re- yeah. you realize Marky Mark did this movie for community service, right? Yeah, yeah uh, he's trying to get that expunged from his record. Yeah, he has to be nice to Asian people on film uh, for the next five films. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why he's in those Transformers movies now. Yeah. They're all taking place in China. Mm-hmm. So just a, a nice bit of meta Boston Marky Mark uh, moment right there. Um, of course, if you're not familiar, he did blind a Vietnamese man uh, for no reason as an asshole teenager. And he's trying to get it expunged from his record so he can open up Wahlburgers in different states because technically he still has a felony. He was uh, convinced to do that by that older guy, Felix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy, they My- accused me of blinding him. All right, I'll show him. Yeah. <laughs> That guy just has radicalized everybody. <laughs> My friend from Chicago started ISIS. Just be, yeah, they think I'm fucking beheading people in the desert. I'm yeah. not, but I'm going to fucking show them. Hey, and Marky Mark's another oaf who was successfully diverted from a life of thuggery and crime. Yeah, from the arts. Little, little like, known fact that uh, that Felix grew up uh, hanging out with Randall Flagg from <laughs> the stand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, okay, so like, we, we all know what happens what in this the story, Dignamont, right? Yeah. The Daniel like the, I guess, if there's a climax to this movie, it is the shootout that happened in Waterhead, Massachusetts, <laughs> which, uh, I, which I remember when it was happening. And this is after they've put the entire city of Boston on like fucking martial law. And there's a scene where the guy who's playing Deval Patrick is like, "I'm making the call. Let's do it." And the movie plays it off like that was totally the right decision, despite what a fucking embarrassment it actually was. The but, entire city shut down all these shots of totally empty Boston streets. And then you see the town of Watertown after the night after the shootout, which was, you know, played in this big fucking over the top blockbuster way, which was actually it was like a fun scene. But it was it's a, like, oh, there's like this shit did not happen. Yeah, the they shootout scene was it was car. good. Hot. It was well yeah. done. Yeah, they're yeah, fucking yeah. like just chucking pipe bombs, yeah. just like cars getting cars flipped over, flipped just over, like yeah. just sh- having it out with the police. And the next morning, and you see in Watertown as the consequences of that order, these fucking military vehicles and tanks going down the suburban street, screaming at old people to stay inside. And it's like, nah, this wasn't a good idea. Well, not to mention that the only reason they got Jahar is some guy just went outside to have a cigarette yeah. so he broke the curfew or whatever but like the, the actual shootout itself uh, I thought was awesome and 
as I was watching it, I was like, do you think they maybe played this scene up a little bit more than the actual thing was? I don't know. It se- certainly seemed that way watching I, I, it. I know that they did chuck a couple of They did couple, bombs chuck a couple of pipe bombs out of a moving but car. But this, this, this is like fucking Donkey Kong. I no, mean, this was like, like, like <laughs> big barrels no, this, like this was like the, on This them. was like the fucking shootout in Heat. Yeah. Like the bank robbery with scene bombs. in Heat. With bombs. Yeah. yeah. So, again, credit to Peter Berg for putting together a pretty good shootout. Yeah. But I was also wondering, maybe this was a little exaggerated. Boston also had the number one shootout of all time. <laughs> all time. <laughs> Fuck so, you, OK Corral. Now, Boston shootout, number one shootout all time. Now, I thought that, so the next part, it is the manhunt, and it is the, the tanks in the streets. And I actually thought the movie was critical of it based on its depiction of it because any reasonable observer looks at that and goes this is this is awful this is america this is a complete overreaction uh and uh i want to talk for a second like uh, simultaneous to this you're seeing the fbi crisis center where the mayor's there tom menino and deval patrick's there and i guess uh, i guess it's critical of patrick right because he was like this indecisive man well he's a democrat yeah he's a democrat he's he's a liberal Uh, he wasn't boston strong no and uh but uh uh, he was like a mini obama but this is by this time they've id'd him and they find the wife they 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 call in tamerlan's wife and yeah, Tamerlane's wife is an interesting character in this movie because she, she, yeah, the FBI they they bring her in after he's been killed, and they're like they they're putting the heat they're turning the heat all the way up on her, and the movie actually I think not so subtly implies that she was the mastermind behind all of this. Perhaps it's, that was it, the accusation that they made. It's weird, it. and there's a scene where they bring in what you think is like a Muslim FBI lady to like be her interrogator this played a, by Candy Alexander who like they, they get her in the box and they bring in Candy Alexander who has like the headscarf and is going to relate to her as a fellow Muslim woman and then like Tamerlane's wife does not crack at all and she's like lawyer, lawyer, lawyer and they're like you don't have rights you don't get a lawyer and then they get to the end of this interrogation and they just let her go oh. yeah they didn't do anything they didn't it should make you less afraid of the de- like both Trump winning and the fact that this like d- white lady who became a, became a Salafist like three months before the bombing, like just totally ran through their shit, should make you never afraid of the deep state again. Yeah, this is the deep. It's like even uh, uh, even Kevin Bacon's character, the FBI counterterrorism guy, has no idea who this is. It's like total CIA, the Muslim lady they deploy for these events. And my favorite part of it was when she was do- the interrogator was doing this Aaron Sorkin shit to it, like uh, to her, like, oh, you think that you think you're going to uh, you you think you're going to go to heaven with your husband. Uh, well, I've got news for you. Have you read the Quran, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was the exact same thing as in the West Wing when he gets all the religious people in the room. Except this lady was so ride or die and had so much taweed that she was like, nah, fuck you. And she was also a convert to Islam. Yeah, she was a convert. Well, there's nothing like the zeal of a convert. That's true. And, oh, yeah, Zerkawi. And then they let her and then they, then they let her go. And they let her go. Well, yeah, we can't talk She's still her. at large, by the way. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. still free. I want to get to the, the, the mini documentary at the end. But before we do, like I said, there's the big climax with the shootout or whatever. And there's one moment that I really like that we talked about after the movie where it's just like in the middle of just like withering gunfire like Watertown police officers, like they break out the M16s and they're just like spraying fire, like in cover, laying down cover fire. And one of the officers just goes, Welcome to Watertown. And it's just supposed to be this like woo moment or whatever. But once again, major cell phone because the drama of the scene is that this rinky dink police department <laughs> is getting fucking owned yeah. by these like teenage assholes they hear a bump and they unleash like 150 <laughs> rounds into this boat yeah, yeah. That, like I a thought, bunch like, of insane barney fifes with ak-47 that's what i thought was a very harrowing part of the scene is it's you you have joe car he's cowering in this boat and they have you know all of this uh, like x-ray shit right and they can see what oh. he's doing inside and he's just there bleeding oh oh wait wait, wait. And the, the, this is great jahar is he's bleeding in a boat that he's just been like cowering in for like an entire night. And there's 200 heavily armed. There's a scene there where they they bring around him everyone, and there's a scene that Peter Berg does where it's just like the, all the snipers are setting up at like uh, roofs and buildings across the street, and it's sort of like this shot where you see a rifle barrel come out of a window, and then you see another and another and another, and it's this like row of windows and houses along the street with like 10 FBI snipers all, and I'm like, do you think you brought enough guys? Do you think this is enough, maybe? And then even there, we get another moment of insufferable Boston color where the FBI hostage rescue team comes in and all of the 
Boston people are supposed to leave, but there's this tough old Boston lady policeman with a with gun. Watertown police. Water, and she's like, uh, a guy shows up, we, we'll take it from here, ma'am. And she's like, get the fuck out of here. This is my spot. I'm not going nowhere. Go Sox. Go Pats. <laughs> <laughs> so they light, they light up the boat. And uh, later, and this goes on for hours, like just hours where they're waiting him out. And later on, uh, it's revealed, oh, he didn't actually have a weapon. Yeah, and when they yeah. get him out, this, this just it's this is their sad attempt at catharsis they've got a bleeding out teenager in this car unarmed but they still have a moment where this dude from the hostage team grabs him out of the thing and slow motion suplexes him basically onto the fucking pavement damn boston strong just like yeah boston fuck strong. you fuck you bleeding out teenager I'm surprised he survived that whole thing it is yeah, very he's surprising like 90 pounds yeah jesus well Christ. the real the real jahar you know, also like me, had a background as a grappler, <laughs> but stopped doing it because he had to devote a lot of time to his ironic podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they also talked about his wrestling or like his boxing career. Well, no, okay, Tamerlane Tamerlane was, was, a boxer. Boxer. was a boxer. Apparently, a very good amateur boxer. Yeah, he was really too. good. He was really good. Um, there's a, there's a scene after the shootout and before the kind of final uh, climax of getting Jahar in the in the boat, where there's uh, sort of light piano and you get shots of the victims recovering and then Wahlberg goes on this teary eyed, uh, reflective thing about you know if we find these guys it's you know that doesn't matter it doesn't matter if we find them now you know we got people out there it's really about them it's really about the victims I, you know revenge what does it really get you and it's just kind of this whole sort of philosophical zooming out that he's doing what are we gonna do we hunt them down catch them kill them all that they're still gonna get us no way it can ever be entirely preventable the devil hits you like that there's only one weapon you have to fight back with it's love and then that ends. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually all about love. But then it ends, and he stands up, and then he basically, he's just like, or let's hunt him down like dogs. And he just, <laughs> he just yeah. like kicks back <laughs> into <laughs> the violence. So they, so they get him, and then there's this huge fucking celebration. Like, the city lets it all out that night. It just cuts to them, and they're all going to fucking bars. And I said to you after we walked out that more people died in drunk driving accidents to celebrate the capture <laughs> than from the attacks themselves. And then the moment that I actually said fuck you at the screen is when the entire screen fills with the image of David Ortiz in yep. fucking Jersey. Yep. And they recreated the scene where he goes, this is our fucking city. <laughs> hey. David Ortiz now an Italian guy from New York. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you fucking assholes. They can't Put let the Red outside Sox of go. the context, yeah. context of sports. Yeah. Anything. <laughs> I mean, you're the I, fucking Athens I, of America, uh, right? I hate Boston Stop so much. Stop fucking talking about <laughs> sports, you asshole. It should have been a Patriots game, and you see Aaron Hernandez with one tear <laughs> going down his cheek. <laughs> yeah, Aaron Hernandez, it. higher body count than yeah. the Boston Bombers. Yes, yes, way higher, true. way higher. <laughs> There's a member of your That's champion Boston. Patriots who's killed more people than the fucking Sarnayevs did. It's Boston strong right there. Yeah. Okay. So, the, yeah, the movie ends, like, you know, uh, the victims, you know, are reunited. There's a positive message about how, you know, terrorism is just a reality of the world today, but, you know, love is how we can beat it. <sighs> and we were like, okay, done. Movie's over. Time to go have fun. Uh, nope. Oh nope. Oh, God, yeah. The movie, Record after scratch. the movie actually ends, it goes on for another 15 minutes where they give you this like mini documentary that features all of the real people talking about the like you know about their experiences and like basically everyone other than Marky Mark's character being like the the real people here. It was so fucking interminable and just like ham-fisted and completely unnecessary it made me so fucking angry because i already wanted to leave the theater like so badly but we had to stick around for this and there, but but there is a couple things of note in this sort of mini documentary the first of which is they feature the real den meng yeah he was, again is like you know this like sort of like upbeat like chinese kid and he's just like you know he's very happy he's like talking about you know his experiences or whatever in an incredibly offensive turn, the filmmakers decided to include subtitles, subtitles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for his English because which they is perfectly understandable. Yeah, he's like he speaks with an accent, but you can understand him, which is 
so fucking ludicrous in comparison to everyone else who's talking in this in this little documentary who is an absolute Boston stereotype. Like, I need subtitles for them, not this fucking Chinese kid. Yeah, that was incredible. The other thing of note, maybe you guys have comments about this. Look, this is going to be the, the most difficult thing to actually say because these are real people. They were victims of a terrible crime. They check in with the, the couple. The, 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 the yuppie couple who lost their... I think the guy lost he one He lost leg. one and she lost both. Yeah. And again... Don't know how to say this, but the guy at one point says, ex- I think they explicitly connect Boston to Paris, Orlando, Karachi. Karachi. I, I mean, Mumbai. we're Mumbai, we're like hundreds yeah. of people were killed, okay? Hundreds of people. And he says, I don't think that we should look at the people who were killed or injured as victims of violent terrorism. I think we should think of them as ambassadors for peace. And seriously, I almost yelled, shut the fuck up at the screen. Because honestly, it was, I made me so fucking angry. Yeah, just cut this whole part. <laughs> yeah, what are we going to do about this shit? Leave it in. Leave it in. No edits. You know what? Just cut everything except Felix talking about being a terrorist. <laughs> Just edit in some Jerry Lewis sound yeah, effects, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Boy, 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 boy. What can you keep from this uh, episode? Oh, no, you can keep everything. It was great. It was. It no, was good. This it, is great. I mean, like, this great. is great. I think you should leave it in because every time we've been yelled at before, it's because of stuff I've said. Okay, but, but you guys are going to experience it now. Here's, here's one uh, possible. Well, uh, this isn't for the show, but uh, he, he, here's, here's <laughs> one idea: is that we make this the premium. <laughs> And we let Adam be on the free one. What do you guys think? Because I feel like Makes this sense. is more premium hours. Well, yeah. Like, real the fans TV, like this, but real premium stuff, hours. The movie stuff is usually premium. It is. That's true. Yeah, That's that a good sense. point. It just felt like more of a premium one. I agree. I agree. Yeah, probably. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brandon, yeah. When are you, where are you going to cut the episode at? Um, at Jerry Lewis, Lewis Noises? What do you mean? Where, well, I think we can... Let, the end point? Let's wrap it up, guys. All right, maybe, wrap maybe, up. We, can we, we can put a capstone here. So that for us is the experience of Boston Strong, the movie. The, the Mark Wahlberg story. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was an experience. I'm, I'm glad we got to, to see it all together. We got to share this experience. With I Kevin we, Bacon. I think with, with Kevin Bacon. I'm glad he wasn't there seeing us leaving the theater because if I had to look in his eye and shake his hand, it would have been awkward. But, I would have um, said thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> to conclude, dun, everybody, dun. Boston, the city, it may be never happy. It may be never content. It may no. fall away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We can't use any of the end of this show. Folks, Patriots Day, the movie. Let's put a ribbon on it. Go Sox. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> this is what you paid for, bitches. This is what you paid for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Done and done. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Cheaters. Oh, yeah, that's definitely <laughs>